Committee, the House and Senate panel that examines and addresses the nation's most pressing economic issues. In addition, Congresswoman Maloney is a senior member of the House Oversight and Government, <coughs> Government Reform Committee. She is also a member of the Out of Iraq Caucus and the Congressional Progressive Caucus. Congressman Maloney. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here with you today. This is a very big day for me. My book came out. I just uh, released a book on March, uh, or rather May 13th, and we had a special reading and, and book signing at Barnes & Noble before coming over uh, to see you tonight. So it's called Rumors of Our Progress Are Greatly Exaggerated, Why Women's Lives Are Not Getting Any Easier. Uh, but what is happening to women in Iraq is even far more severe. We had a uh, very big week in Congress last week. And, uh, and first of all, I just want to make it very clear to all of you that I am committed uh, to working to end the war in Iraq as soon as possible. <laughs> and I am a member of the Out of Iraq Caucus, and we have tried various strategies, uh, hearings, uh, uh, demonstrations, petitions, and votes on the floor of Congress. And I have repeatedly voted to end the war, to redeploy our troops, and to stop funding Bush's war. We made a very important statement on Thursday. As you know, the bill that funds the war was on the House of Representatives floor. And we wanted to make sure that everyone is on record about that war. And I compliment uh, Congressman Obie for structuring a bill that put everyone on record on where they stood for the funding for the war, where they stood for redeployment, and where they stood for the needed unemployment uh, benefits and other funding that we needed in the supplemental. We wanted to make sure that people could not hide their positions by voting for a single package and then say, well, you know, I really wanted to vote for those GI benefits, but I was opposed to the war. We made it very clear. We separ separated each point out in a separate vote to put people on record. Thursday's bill was taken up in three separate votes, funding for the war, timetable for withdrawal, and funding for domestic priorities, such as the new GI bill for returning veterans, paying for the census, extending unemployment benefits. I voted against the funding for the war, and usually we don't have the votes, I, because all of the Republicans vote for it, and our caucus, the Democratic caucus, is uh, split, it's divided. But uh, we won. <laughs> we didn't expect to win, but we won. <laughs> but we, we do not believe that it will survive the Senate the amendment failed 149 to 141, and 132 Republicans voted present. That's why it failed. They just did not take a vote. But I can tell you that what we're doing in the Senate, a lot of our initiatives are failing in the Senate. I serve on the Financial Services Committee, as he noted, and we have sent to the Senate well over 50 bills. Only two have come back. Uh, so what we send to the Senate, uh, uh, really does, usually does not su survive. Most uh, Democrats view this action as a tactic to give the Republicans a chance to ca campaign on the platform that a majority of Democrats do not support the troops. I think that that is a very strong losing strategy. Most Americans do not support this war. Most people agree that we are supporting the troops by voting to end funding for the war and to bring our veterans home to their families. It is the Bush administration that does not support the troops. And the Bush administration's only withdrawal plan is for him to leave office. They refuse to talk about any alteration in their policy. 
The Bush administration sent this government on a wild goose chase for weapons of mass destruction that don't exist. And they got us in the middle of an unending conflict in a country that is divided against itself. America should get out of the crossfire. We're only making things worse by providing a target that all sides can agree on to hate and causing great destruction in the process, as the previous speaker pointed out, to families and children. I also voted for the second provision to redeploy our troops within 30 days of the bill's enactment with the goal of completing withdrawal of all combat troops by December 2009, and that passed by a vote of 227 to 196. And finally, I supported in support of the third provision, which had necessary funding to provide Iraq and Afghan, Afghan uh, veterans with a new GI Bill. This GI Bill is not as generous as the one that my father had when he fought in World War II, but uh, it does have employment, it does have health care, it does have education. It also, we passed uh, an extension of unemployment benefits, which is very important because many Americans are losing their jobs in this recession. And uh, it did provide money for the census, which is important, because if we don't get an accurate count, then we don't have accurate representation and we don't have accurate funding formulas. And the Republicans have made a mess of the census along with the economy, along with the war, and many other areas. And this bill, the one that we voted on Thursday, represents the strongest statement Congress has ever made about the need to end the war now. And I hope it survives the Senate intact, and I hope the President will sign it. <laughs> Dream on! But you can hope. One of the issues that I have been uh, most concerned about has been the precar pre precarious state of Iraqi women. When the Iraqis were drafting their constitution, I urged the State Department, uh, along with the Women's Caucus in Congress, to focus on the need to ensure that Iraqi women were included in the constitution. Uh, incidentally, American women are not in our constitution, but we were fighting to get the Iraqi women in the constitution. And I warned against the risk that Islamic law, Sharia, would be embedded in their constitution. Sharia-based legal decisions on an interpretation of the Quran that disadvantages women and children in many situations, particularly when it comes to family law. Prior to the first Gulf War, Iraq was one of the most permissive Islamic nations in the Middle East when it came to women's rights. Following the war, Saddam Hussein allowed a shift toward observance of Sharia and he gave tribal leaders freedom to act upon traditional tribal codes. In 1990, Saddam Hussein added language in the Iraqi penal code that exempted men from punishment for the practice of honor killings. That gave men the right to kill female relatives who had committed or been involved in perceived sexual improprieties, even if the women were raped. In 2002, the UN Special uh, report on violence against women reported that over 4,000 Iraqi women had been killed for hurting their family's reputation. The Congressional Research Service reports that a trend of decreasing literacy has been reported by the Iraqi government during the 1990s. And in 2000, the United Nations estimated that adult illiteracy among Iraqi women was approximately 45 percent an increase from a reported 25% illiteracy rate in 1987. Another stark example of how this war is hurting women and families. Since the U.S. invasion into Iraq, Congress has allocated significant sums that specifically help Iraqi women with democratic organization, education, advocacy, and entrepreneurship. When the Iraq Constitution was being drafted, I urge the State Department to advocate for a provision requiring equal protection for men and women. I arranged for Beate Sarate Gordon, the woman responsible for inserting language in the Japanese Constitution that enabled women to gain rights after World War II. I urged her to testify and arranged for her to come and meet uh, with leaders in Congress. 
Although she is not particularly well known in the United States, she has been called one of the world's most influential women for the extraordinary impact she's had in securing equal rights for Japanese women. I hoped our government might remember her example and insist that some of these clauses be included in the new constitution. The original language of the draft was very harsh. It said Islam was the source of the law. That was amended after a huge outcry by women to say that Islam is a fundamental source of law. It may be a small distinction, but it's a very important one. There's other troublesome language as well. The Constitution prohibits Parliament from passing laws that contradict the established laws of Islam. Nonetheless, nonetheless, there's also language that's good. The new Constitution forbids discrimination on gender or ethnic grounds and prohibits legislation that uh, contravenes human rights law. We need to pay attention, though, to what's happening to Iraqi women and make sure that it's well known. And we know that bad things are starting to happen. CNN reported in February that in Basra, a stronghold of conservative Shia groups, as many as 133 women were killed in Basra last year, 79 for violations of Islamic teachings, and 47 for so-called honor killings. Uh, there was a sign in red paint just outside the main downtown market that read, we warn against not wearing a headscarf and wearing makeup. Those who do not abide by this will be punished. God is our witness. We have notified you. And uh, uh, this, this is really terrible, but more than any statistic, uh, we were meeting with Iraqi women. Uh, they were coming to our country, and we had the opportunity to meet with many of them. At the beginning, they were very strong and outspoken and very uh, optimistic about building a democracy. In the end, they were telling us, please don't, don't mention my name. Don't let anyone know I talked to you. I was a judge. They demonstrated outside my court. I can no longer practice. I was a nurse. I was a doctor. I can no longer practice. Uh, they are really rolling back uh, women's rights and women's participation in their society to a dramatic degree. And all reports show from the United Nations and everywhere that when you empower women and when you empower families, that it increases the strength of the village, the strength of the family, the strength of the opportunities for the children. So there are many, many tragedies in Iraq, uh, one of uh, which is, uh, was graphically shown in the, in the photographs by the prior speaker, but in the stories that we have heard from the women in Iraq, it's just blood curdling how they have uh, lost uh, their, their wings, lost their position. And unlike many countries like Afghanistan and others, women were strong participating members in their society, educated and, and, and strong. Uh, yet uh, this has been turned uh, over on its back with the Sharia law and uh, with the, um, along with the others of uh, great tragedies that are taking place in Iraq. I join you in your commitment and compliment you for your leadership in uh, really holding uh, members of Congress, uh, press, uh, the communities accountable uh, on keeping a strong eye on what's happening in Iraq and making it a focus of the United States government to bring our troops home. We tried many, many times on the floor of of Congress, and I see many faces of many friends of mine who said, why can't you stop this war? Why can't you? We're a democracy. We depend on votes. And uh, we have failed every single time, except for this Thursday. And quite frankly, when we went to the floor, we didn't know how our colleagues on the other side of the aisle were going to vote. But when it passed, or rather it failed, the funding failed, our, our goal passed, uh, we were just ecstatic. One of my good friends, Lynn Woolsey, has been one of the prime leaders in the uh, Get Out of Iraq uh, a caucus. She deserves uh, the gratitude of all of us, along with uh, Barbara Lee. Uh, they have uh, really been the prime uh, leaders in our, in our caucus uh, for, for keeping the attention on this issue. Uh, practically every single week, uh, they organize some type of meeting or some type of outcry or some type of focus to keep our attention on this important issue. Let me tell you that it is uh, always a pleasure for me to be at 1199 uh, for many of the progressive cause, causes and meetings that we've been here to advance, primarily health care. Uh, they've been a union uh, that has been uh, very concerned about the fact that 45 million people in America no longer have health care and that the number is, 
is growing yet another reason to elect a Democratic president. And I must say how thrilling we were in Congress last week when we picked up yet another House seat in Mississippi, of all places, Mississippi. And we won uh, three uh, special elections. It's the first time that that's happened in 30 years in this country. And I think that there is a shift uh, against the Republican leadership, not only for the war in Iraq, but for their failed economic policies and their failed health care policies and their failed environmental policies. And so I would say that definitely under their administration, rumors of our progress has been greatly exaggerated. And it is definitely time for a change and never underestimate the ability of one person or one organization uh, to bring great change in our society. So thank you for having me here today. And I'd be willing to take questions if that's appropriate. Hi, Ruth. <laughs> Congresswoman Maloney. Um, oh, great. Would you like to be no, I'm fine. I'm fine. Okay. Um, the way I've been sitting all day. <laughs> the way we're going to structure the comments and questions is to open uh, this town hall meeting to the floor. And uh, if you have specific questions, they won't be answered um, as the questions come up. But we'll, uh, we'll let people comment and post questions and then uh, give the speakers an opportunity to wrap up and, um, and answer questions and comment at the end. So I will uh, uh, limit questions at this point to two minutes each. Uh, but if you have a comment or a question, it's not question and answer, it's comments and questions. We want to know what you're thinking. Uh, you have uh, some incredible speakers up front, but you have a room full of people who are trying to end this war. So let's work together and um, and get this uh, town hall meeting, a real town hall meeting. So um, uh, the woman in the back. Yeah. 
Sir.
follow thugs committed. That's right. We Democrats will do nothing. That's right. To get them out of power or be accountable. And I'm sorry, I cannot accept that. I cannot accept voting for more Democrats now. A Democratic president. How often are we going to buy the same story and expect a different outcome? That's the definition of a mental illness. And that's what being a Democrat has become. Thank you. to fund this war. 
um, as she did last, last week. It might be called uh, a withdrawal funding, but it, it's actually a funding. Um, the third uh, vote was for the uh, veterans benefits. Sounds good to me. Now, um, I, I'm hoping that um, um, this evening, uh, Congresswoman Maloney can pledge not to vote one penny more for the occupation of Iraq. And the reason why I'm opposed to impeachment is 
comments and questions, so get, get them in. Um, yes. I would like to ask why nothing has been said tonight about the financial cost of war and the fact that we are paying mercenaries who are not uh, under any regulations whatsoever and are paid more than our farmers. On that one, I, I, I'd like to respond. Uh, I did a report with Senator Schumer on the high cost of the war. You can get it on my website. And, uh, I don't have a computer. Um, if you give me your name and address, I'll mail it to you. And it, it's absolutely devastating. They, they uh, oh gosh. Uh, in one day, they're spending more than they're spending on our entire infrastructure for the broken levees that happened in Katrina and our, and our broken uh, bridges that are crumbling. And uh, in one day, you could, for five days, you could totally fund the S-CHIP program to expand uh, health, chip, health care for our children uh, by the cost of the war. And if we continue on uh, this road route, uh, it, it will cost us, uh, by 2012, $3 trillion more. Uh, so it is, it is devastating, uh, this country, the high cost of the war. And we did uh, do a report on that that, that uh, might answer some of your questions of, of, our, of our outrage. Yeah. Okay, I do want to get back to um, our attendees. Yes, ma'am.
Yes. Um, I just wanted to go back on what you were saying about the bottles of the war. Um, I know the bottles of the war is just putting our country in deeper and deeper, like a national debt. I just don't understand why like, everybody is going to want to reward stuff. They're just putting our entire country in the debt. Like oil is more expensive, the entire world is becoming more expensive. Like gas is like five dollars a gallon. Like, like especially the new drivers' insurance is expensive and high gas prices. This is ridiculous. Like I don't think that Republicans or Democrats should be fighting like each side for the war to stop. It's just putting our like, entire nation. Like it's just providing us more of the war. And I feel that if we end it. Um, thank you. Uh, um, uh, okay, one one more, and then we're going to uh, get the wrap up from the speakers. Yes, this gentleman. Yes, I just want to say, as a constituent of Representative Maloney, that I greatly appreciated the openness and responsiveness of her office because I've contacted her office many times and I've always got the response back, and I appreciate it. Uh, very much that we do have such good representatives in in our Congress who do pay attention to their constituents. The other thing is, I just have to believe that uh, electing either Clinton or Obama will be uh, years ahead of having McCain here. Because at least, at least, I believe that they have committed to withdrawing from Iraq and McCain at last. Uh, the last things he was saying, we could be there a hundred years. So if anybody believes that there isn't going to be some difference uh, with these uh, candidates, then I, I, I think it's uh, an unfortunate commentary. And also, uh, just think about the Supreme Court, if nothing else. Oh, yeah. um, I, I, I'm sorry, but um, I'm sorry, we had, we had, had we, uh, go ahead. Because, uh, all right. I have been through a lot of peace movements in my time, from Vietnam, well, civil rights, you know, the peace movement, to Vietnam, the whole thing. Everyone is gone home when it's happening, but once things start down, where are you all? I've been fighting this for years. But the younger people, you'll be enthusiastic now, but when things resolve, oh, nothing to worry about, you go along with us. You've got to keep the movement going. I tell you, I've been in this for many decades, don't ask how long. Keep the movement going. Okay, we're going to uh, go, go to the um, go to the speakers and um, uh, should we do it in the order of <coughs> does somebody want to go to go first? But I'm hoping that uh, somebody will uh, take on that comment that um, Obama and Clinton are for ending this war. I don't Good. Okay. Um, Dan. Yeah, um, I'm just going to speak to a few of the things that were raised because the time is limited and I don't, I don't consider myself an expert on everything. Um, now, I, I want to speak to what, uh, what the young woman from, um, from England said. Uh, what, what does one do when you, when you guys, I mean, everyone in this room has been at the game of protesting far longer than I have, I'm, I'm sure, and I'm at it, I've been at it long enough to feel exhausted, and I can only share with you with what I have come up with, uh, what I think the answer to that is, and I've come to believe that uh, protesting is something that you do when you live in a democracy. Uh, and unfortunately, if you, you look around this country, you start feeling like you live in something else. And it's, it's that it's recently that I learned that we don't live in a democracy at all. Uh, we live literally, we live in a polyarchy. Uh, this is not a government of the people and for the people, because if it was, why would people be frustrated at their own leadership, the leadership that's present here tonight? There's a lot of anger in the room. If we were self-governing and we were upset with our leadership, we would be self-loathing, but we're not. Um, so what you do when you're in a democracy is you protest, but what we probably ought to do, as the young man in the third row uh, recently identified, is we ought to resist. Uh, and what does resistance look like? Well, resistance, like protesting, looks like a thousand different things. Um, and to put it in the most general possible terms, resistance is anything that is harmful to the enterprise that you are trying to, to end. The war is very large. It's, it encompasses a good number of things. There must be thousands of ways to resist. 
And it is, it is incumbent on the people who want to end this, this war crime and save our country, save what, what remains of, of our values and our lifestyle and whatever other uh, nonsense everyone likes to talk about. I don't really care for myself. I'm more concerned with, with the plight of those who are suffering and dying as a result of what uh, the president forces forward and what Congress doesn't seem able to stop. We have that power if we choose to have that power. And anything that we do collectively against uh, that this war machine that moves forward helps the resistance. There's resistance uh, at home and there's resistance abroad. But there are 20,000 troops AWOL. Uh, that's a fantastic start. And how much support do they have from us? How many host them in our homes? How many publicly defend them and, and say that we're proud of the brave sacrifices that our soldiers and Marines make who are AWOL in our unauthorized absence, what of these uh, resistant service personnel who refuse to fight, they should be the heroes of the young boys and girls in our schools. Uh, so that's what I mean. The answer is resistance when, when the protest fails. And it has Depleted uranium is a serious problem. Moving on to the next thing. Um, the United States government, it's unfortunate, it does not acknowledge that depleted uranium is, uh, is, is this uh, harmful, poisonous substance that, that all these people are exposed to, to acknowledge that, or to, to, you understand, but to give benefits to someone who suffers the effects of depleted uranium exposure would be to acknowledge that you made a decision to use this weapon system that is harmful. It was known when it was fielded that it was, that it would that it caused cancer, it was tetrogenous, and so on and so forth. But, you know, uh, that's been understood by the Pentagon, and it's been policy to ignore whatever science comes forth to tell the Pentagon, tell the government they should not use it. Um, just to, I know that uh, Dahlia went into uh, depleted uranium and how it works and, and everything behind it. I, I've, I've seen a tank that was destroyed by depleted uranium, and this 70-ton steel vehicle did not look like a tank anymore. It looks like a charred charcoal briquette the size of a tractor trailer. That's what a depleted uranium round does to a um, to an Abrams tank and the round that hit it, the amount of depleted uranium is about this long and it's about a half an inch around. Turned that tank into this charred pile of, of I don't know what. And uh, we use it in small arms, we use it in tank rounds, we use it in, in hellfire tipped missiles launched from Apache helicopters. All of these weapons are used uh, indiscriminately on whatever targets, armed or unarmed, our forces encounter. And that's happening, and that's not disputed. It's happening right now. And whether or not the member of Congress here with us tonight is aware of this uh, is irrelevant. It is happening. I don't think that they tell Congress everything. Uh, but we know this to be true. We have witnesses and we have evidence, and that's that's why it's further incumbent on us to resist. Um, and there was one other thing I want to address, and that was what does withdrawal look like? Uh, withdrawal, immediate unconditional withdrawal, is very easy. You get every uh, plane, boat, truck, car, everything that moves on its own power, you load into it all the military personnel, all military hardware, all remnant of our devastation onto them and you push your foot against the accelerator as hard as possible, <laughs> that wet is a man urgent, it's not hard. And, but we don't seem to be able to figure out how to do this self-evidently, obviously, easy thing to do. Uh, well, now, what of the leaving this power vacuum in the, the ensuing civil war? Uh, it's, it's really strange that, it's, that we pretend like it's our business or our concern to begin with. Uh, because the safety and security of Iraqis never has been the concern or interest of Americans or the American government. It's it's just it's observably not their concern. It never has been. But you know you can you can um, turn sovereignty over temporarily to an international body of, of a multinational body of countries, mostly of that region that understand Iraqis' interests. That does not include the United States because that quite understandably they do not trust the United States with that kind, of, uh, that kind of power, but that's just one option. The withdrawal is the first thing that must happen before any of the other items on the agenda. Thank you.
You bring the troops home from Iraq and Afghanistan and they will stop dying there and that is the only thing that will accomplish that mission. <laughs>
And we have to remember that when he took office, he had a $5 trillion surplus. He has squandered it, and we now have an $8 trillion uh, debt, the largest deficit in her history and the largest trade deficit in history. And any area you look at, uh, education, healthcare, environment, uh, everywhere you look, there's vast differences between the Democrats and the Republicans. And they change uh, in electing a Democrat will, uh, I think, help this country tremendously. When we talk about all the oil that's in Iraq, it has been this Democratic Congress that has put forward an energy policy that works towards energy independence, investing in biofuels, ethanol, and for the first time in 30 years, uh, standards for cars to be more efficient in their use of, of gasoline. I must tell you that I think the oil lobby is going crazy because all of a sudden I'm getting people calling me that maybe ethanol is not the answer. It takes so much water, it takes so much energy. But ethanol, switchgrass, this type of thing will move us away. And I think what we need to look at in terms of the protecting the environment is to invest in, in biofuels and, and, and different uh, energies and to move us away from the dependence on oil. I think it's very, very important. Now, yeah, exactly. Let's get let's get into mass 